In this assignment project, we're going to create a memory game. And the purpose of this assignment is to give you some more practice on grid layouts, but we're going to introduce some new things. One of those is the ability to bind controls. Now, normally we bind controls to data. In this case, though, we're going to bind control attributes to the attributes of other controls. And the purpose here is to try to get these buttons to be square. We're going to do some platform-specific code in that we're going to, in this cross-platform Xamarin project, we're going to create our code such that we can have a different background color and different colors of our labels based on the platform. So here on this iOS emulator, I have a white background with black text. On the Android emulator, I'll have a dark background with lighter text. And then on the Windows simulator, I'm going to have a more colorful background. And we can do all that in our C-sharp code. There's also ways to do it in our XAML code. Uh, your book specifies some of that that still works. I prefer to do it in C-sharp. We're going to look at how to create, how to add a device timer to our project. And then finally, we'll, we'll add some audio capabilities. And there we're going to import a NuGet package that makes things a little bit simpler. So just to demonstrate what this project looks like and how it works, um, what I have here are, I have a couple labels here at the top, a couple labels at the bottom, a button, uh, a copyright label down here. And then the focus is these four buttons. And the four buttons have colored backgrounds. And the idea of the game is when we begin play, the, the device is going to choose a sequence of five different colors and play those at intervals of one second. So I'm going to go ahead and click begin play. And so there we had a sequence of blue, green, green, red, blue. Now it's my turn. And I don't know if you heard the audio. Let's see if I can bring the audio up a little bit here. Okay, so we had blue, green, green, red, blue. And so I get a congratulations message. Told me I repeated the sequence of five items. And now it's the next round. So in the next round, the device is going to add one color to the sequence that we've already established, that blue, green, green, red, blue. And I have to repeat that six uh, item sequence again. Each round, however, the speed of the display is going to, is going to increase. Okay, so now it's my turn. And I've successfully done six items. Now we'll add a seventh. I'm going to click next round. And the game continues on until the person fails to do the sequence. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and make a fail here. So I'm going to go blue, green, blue. And now I failed on that one. And I'm given a feedback message of, sorry, that's incorrect. You successfully repeated a sequence sequence of seven items. So remember the last one that I did, this was eight items, and tells me how well I did on that last term successfully. I can play again, and we'll start the sequence all over again, with five, starting with five uh, colors. Um, let me just show you how this looks different on different platforms. So I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio. I'm going to end my iOS platform. Let's go to Android. So you can see on the Android, it's got a dark background, and I use the antique white 
for the colors of the, of the text of the labels, as well as the border around my four buttons. Okay, I'm gonna end that, and let's go to the Universal Windows. And here you can see how I'm doing this in my C Sharp, and I, I did this in the constructor, our main page constructor. After initializing the components, I have some code using a switch statement, and I'm looking at the device.runtime platform. That tells me if this is an iOS, Android, or UWP device. So if it's iOS, I'm setting the background color to white and setting the padding uh, because iOS has uh, some information at the very top of their screens. I want to pad that 20 at the top. Remember, this is left, top, right, bottom. For Android, it's a very slight uh, padding at the top, but here I'm setting the color to black. And the, I have a method that I created called set accent colors. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, that sets the color to antique white. So it was black up here on iOS. And then for UWP, I did a dark orchid background. Give a 25 unit uh, padding at the top and then set the accent colors to cyan. And then of course we need a default. So the default probably would never run uh, unless we were using some other device besides iOS, Android, or UWP. And there's a, I just did black and white. Let's take a look at that set accent color. So here's the set accent color. Um, I created two arrays, one for my labels, my five different labels, one for my squares. These are the big colored button squares. And then in a loop, I changed the text color of the labels um, to whatever color has been passed to it. Might be antique white, might be black on the iOS. And then since I only since I have five labels and only four buttons, I only change the button squares sub I border color to CLR if it's one through four. If I didn't do this, I would get an error because I'd be out of out of bounds because there's not a fifth element here for the button squares. Okay, so let's run this on the simulator uh, for UWP. And there you can see the dark orchid and the cyan colors and the borders of our buttons are also colored. All right, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to jump over to the XAML code here for the project and talk about binding. So in the XAML code, I have a grid definition with four rows and four columns, the two middle rows are the rows where my buttons are going. So I set the height to two asterisk. So in essence, there are three rows here that take up two sevenths and the top row takes up one seventh. And then for the columns, I set the, col the two middle columns to be equal width and then the first and last column to have a width of auto. So then I have a stack layout at, in the top row gives me my title label and my subtitle label. And then here are the four buttons that are being used to create those big color buttons. And here's where we do some binding. So my first button, I named BTN square one. Um, it's in grid row, column one. So it's gonna be the second row, second column. I set the horizontal options and vertical options to fill. So it's gonna fill that row in width. Now, the height is that two asterisk value. It's two sevenths of our interface, but I want to set the width to be the same. That's going to define that star width for me. So here's where we can use a binding. Now, normally it was binding for data, but I can bind to other attributes in some cases, and width request is one of those. So I'm going to bind it to the height of my object, and the source is going to be a reference to the object itself, BTN square. I want to make the width the same as the height of BTN square one. Now remember, this is a width request. It's going to try to do that. In some cases, it won't be able to. So I've seen on some of the emulators that are much taller than their width, sometimes they get more of a rectangle. But for the most part, this does work. BTN square two, same thing. Um, I'm going to set the width. I'm just going to set it to the same square, my square one, um, and I just wise, this probably should be height, even though it does work. I really want to set it to the same height as square one, and the same one here. So 
So I could have done these two themselves, but since I've established this first square, I'm gonna make the, the width the same as on all three of these. So that's how we do binding of attributes in XAML to the attributes of other objects. It says sometimes it works because it is a re request. Sometimes it's unable to do that. And then finally, I concluded with the stack layout of my th with my labels and my button. So that's our XAML code. I'm going to run this again in the simulator. Let's go back to our Android simulators. They made a couple changes to the width request. I just want to make sure that, that still looks good. And there we go. It does look good. I can begin play. everything seems to work. So that's the binding control attributes in the platform specific code. And I lay all this out in the assignment instructions. You can get that. I also include the audio file that you use for the little beep sound in the assignment area of our Canvas course site. And so device timers and adding audio using NuGet. Let me just demonstrate that really quickly and then uh, I'll give you more details in the assignment instructions. To add a NuGet package, we simply right click up here on the very top, choose Manage NuGet Packages for Solution. And what I did was I went to Browse and I browsed in this case for a NuGet package called Simple Audio Recorder. And this is the one that I want, is the XAM plugin. And I would simply come and install that in all of my project solutions. And you see I've already got it installed, but here I would click install if it wasn't installed. So that's how I added the NuGet package. Now I'm going to go back to my C sharp code because then to use that I added in this plugin called plugin.simple audio player. Once I did that, then in my code on the constructor I could create a stream and tell it what audio file I want to use. Now I imported the audio file here into my project, again by simply going to, this time, the, the shared project, right click, chose add, existing item, and I went and found that low beep sound that I wanted to use. And that brought it in into here. Then, in, back in my code, I've created this player. Now, the player is a class-level object, iSimple Audio Player. I take the player, I create the simple audio player, and then I simply load the stream. So I preload the object. Any time I want to make that sound, I simply say player.play. Here is the file, f the method for get stream creating assembly, creating the stream variable, and I'm returning the stream. One key is make sure you put in your namespace. And then here's the code where I'm playing the sound. I'm lighting up one of the squares, and then I've got player.play that plays that low beep sound. So that's how we add in the audio. Let's look at the timer real quick. So on the timer, I created a double variable called timer delay. This is in milliseconds. I set a value to 1,000. Um, I also have a Boolean value of timer play bool that determines whether that timer continues on or whether it ends. If it's set to false, the timer will end. And I have a method called play sequence. Again, this is all laid out in instructions. Um, but here I'm starting a timer, device.startTimer. I'm telling it the time span. How, how many times a second do I want this to execute? Timer delay starts at 1,000, so 1,000 divided by 1,000 is one second. And then 
This is a lambda expression. You can read about lambda expressions by Googling or going to YouTube. And I'm calling a method in this case, next sequence, and I'm returning timer play bool. As long as that is true, the timer continues to run. Once that is set to false, that's how I end the timer, um, the timer stops. That's a quick rundown on timers and adding in new get packages. Um, now it's your turn to go ahead and create this project.